please welcome to the stage senior developer for Shopify, Kirsten Westinda. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me this morning. Especially happy to see so many people in the crowd after how fun the after party last night was. <laughs> Um, if any questions come up during this talk, I'll be available for a little while outside after this, and I'll also be at the developer drop-in later this afternoon. I joined Shopify six years ago. At the time, we had less than 200 employees and were serving around 70,000 merchants with a relatively straightforward online sale and point-of-sale offering. Fast forward to today, and we're over 4,000 employees and are serving over 800,000 merchants all over the world. And our product offering is much more complex. We learned a lot about how to build software along the way, and I want to share some of those learnings with you here today. Shopify is built using Ruby on Rails, and it started similarly to all Rails projects, with a command to rails.new. Our CEO, Toby, was also our first engineer, and he started building Shopify using a zipped version of Rails that was emailed to him by DHH, its creator. Shopify is now one of the largest Ruby on Rails code bases out there. Um, and the architectural ideas in this talk can actually be applied to other programming languages as well, but I will be giving some examples to help drive the points home, and they will be in the context of our Rails application. So, at some point in the not-so-distant past, Shopify was a massive monolith. For those of you that are not familiar with Ruby on Rails, all code is globally accessible. So what that means is you can call anything from anywhere without having to explicitly say that you depend on it to be able to get access to it. And our product was responsible for a lot. It was responsible for collecting customer payments, billing merchants, handling shipping, taxes, managing developer apps, customer checkout, creating orders, the list goes on and on. And all of this was being powered by the same Shopify core code base. What global accessibility in Rails meant for us at Shopify is that the code that we used to calculate tax rates could use pieces of the code that we used to calculate shipping rates, and vice versa, even though they power very distinct areas of our product. Now, there are a lot of benefits to monoliths. They've been getting an especially bad rap in the technical scene recently. So I want to emphasize that while it is no longer the best solution for us at Shopify, it was for a very long time. I would actually still recommend that new companies and new products start off with a monolith. Let me explain why. In the beginning, the number one priority is getting your product to market. It's not necessarily worth spending too much time trying to get your design to be perfect. And even if you do put in all the time up front, there's no way that you'll get it 100% correct because you don't have enough information about your product and its domain yet. So start with little design and move as fast as you can to add the required functionality. However, a time will come where it becomes slower and slower to add the same amount of incremental functionality. Where all three lines meet on the graph on the screen denotes the perfect time to invest in design. Martin Fowler refers to reaching this point as crossing the design payoff line. Now, unfortunately, no one's going to come and knock on your door and let you know when you've reached this point. Also, unfortunately, attempting to redesign too early or too late both have some downsides. So what I'm going to do today is share some of the symptoms that we experienced that told us that we had passed our design payoff line in hopes that they might help you identify when you reach yours. We realized we had to re-architect in early 2016 when the cons of our monolithic system began to outweigh the pros. Specifically, there were a couple of things that served as tripwires for us. Making a seemingly innocuous change could trigger a cascade of unrelated test failures or production issues. In the example I gave earlier, if the calculation of tax rates and shipping rates are sharing code, then if we want to update how we calculate our shipping rates, it could break the tests for our tax rates without it being super clear why. Secondly, developing in Shopify was requiring a lot of context to make simple changes. So it was taking new developers way too long to onboard. A developer joining the apps team had to not only understand our apps code, but also our billing code, order creation, and much more, just to be able to effectively make a change to app-related code. And lastly, the tests were so slow to run that a lot of people fully opted out of running them locally. And they were also quite painful to write due to how entangled all of our objects were. All of these challenges were affecting developer productivity and happiness. We realized that all of the things we liked about our monolith were a result of the code living in and being deployed to one place. But, and all the issues we were experiencing were a direct result of a lack of boundaries between distinct functionality in our code. So it was clear that we needed to decrease the coupling between different domains. So a team of engineering leaders set out to come up with a plan. 
One solution that is very trendy in the industry is microservices. It is an option that we explored, but one that we quickly ruled out. While microservices would address a lot of the problems we were experiencing, they'd also bring with them a whole other suite of problems. We'd have to maintain multiple different test and deployment pipelines and take on infrastructural overhead for each additional service. We'd also have to get creative about accessing the data that we need when we need it, since the services couldn't easily share a database the way that a monolith could. And since each service is deployed independently, communicating between them means crossing the network, which adds latency with every call and decreases the overall reliability of the system. And it also increases vulnerability because you have to manage dependencies in multiple different places. So if there's a security vulnerability in one, you have to remember to update it everywhere. And sometimes when you're making large refactors across all of the services, they can be rather tedious, especially when you need to coordinate the deploys. So this is not to say that microservices are never the right solution, but they were not the right solution for us at the time. Especially because transitioning from our current monolithic solution to microservices would likely have meant starting from scratch due to how intertwined all of our functionality was at this point. And we weren't super keen on scrapping more than 10 years of work. So where did this leave us? We knew that microservices wouldn't work going forward, but neither would our existing monolith. We were able to get buy-in from the product and business side to invest in this because they had seen the time needed for the same amount of incremental functionality in increase over the years and eventually reach an unacceptable point. We wanted to be data informed when coming up with our solution to ensure that it was designed to actually solve the problem at hand and not just the anecdotally reported one. So a survey was sent out to all of the developers working in the core code base to identify what the main pain points were. The survey resulted in kicking off a project that was initially named Break Core Up into Multiple Pieces. This is what happens when you let developers name things. The goal of it was to increase modularity without increasing the number of deployment units, allowing us to get the advantages of both monoliths and microservices without so many of the downsides. A modular monolith is a system where all of the code that powers an application lives in the same code base and is deployed to the same place, but there are strictly enforced boundaries between the different domains. The Break Core Up into Multiple Pieces project eventually evolved into being called Componentization, which is our version of implementing a modular monolith. This all sounds like a nice idea, but what does it mean in practice? The approach that we took can loosely be broken down into these three steps. Reorganizing our code, isolating the dependencies, and then enforcing the boundaries between them. So this might make it look easy. I want to take a second to ensure that no one's hopes are artificially gotten up. It was definitely very challenging. We at Shopify have had a lot of very smart people working on this for two years now. And while we have definitely seen a lot of improvement, we still do have a ways to go. So let's look at, into each of these three steps in a bit more detail. The first issue that we chose to address was our code organization. At the time, our code was organized like a typical Rails application. So the top level was software concepts like models, views, and controllers. We wanted to reorganize it by real world concepts like billing, orders, and taxes. In an attempt to make it easier to locate code, to locate the people who understand that code, and to be able to understand the individual pieces of the system on their own. We decided to split the code into components, where each component would be structured as a mini Rails application. We eventually want to take this one step further and namespace each component as a Ruby module. Now, coming up with this initial list of components was no easy task. It involved a lot of research and input from stakeholders in each area of the company. We did this by listing out every single Ruby class, there were around 6,000 at the time, in a massive spreadsheet and manually labeling which component each one belonged in. Then, once the spreadsheet was complete, we achieved the move with one Big Bang PR auto built by automated scripts. Even though no code was changed in this process, it still touched our entire code base and was potentially very risky if done incorrectly. Since the changes introduced were just file moves, the failures that might occur would result from our code not knowing where to find object definitions, which would result in runtime errors. Now, our code base is pretty well tested, so by running our tests locally and in CI without any issues, as well as running through as much functionality as possible locally and on staging, we were able to ensure that nothing was missed. And we chose to do it all in one PR to disrupt our developers as little as possible, because after that, you can imagine the rebases that had to happen. Once we had our code organized into components, the next step is isolating the dependencies by decoupling the components from one another. Each component defined a clean, dedicated interface with domain boundaries expressed through a public API and took exclusive ownership of its associated data. 
The componentization team couldn't achieve this for the whole Shopify code base. Doing so required the involvement of experts from each business domain. So every development team took responsibility to do this for the component that they owned. What the componentization team did do was provide the patterns to use as well as the tools needed to complete the task. One tool that we rely on heavily for our componentization efforts is Wedge, which we built in-house to track the progress of each component towards its goal of isolation. Wedge highlights any violations of domain boundaries and data coupling across boundaries. It builds up a call graph and uses it to determine which of these cross-component things are okay and which are violating. As a rule of thumb, associations and inheritance across domain boundaries are always violating. And calls are violating when another component is accessed through anything other than its public API. Wedge then computes an overall score as well as lists violations per component. We're able to use these scores to initiate a little bit of healthy competition between our development teams, which gets people much more motivated to work on this tech debt. We're also able to use it to enforce certain standards, like each component should be at at least 50% progress by a certain date. The value of using tools to track progress against a goal cannot be understated. However, it's worth noting that, as with all metrics, this one comes with its own set of issues. People will always end up optimizing for the thing that you're measuring, so you have to ensure that you're measuring the right thing. Metrics should only be used in combination with common sense. How we measure the success of our componentization project will change over time as our knowledge evolves. In the long term, we'd like to take this one step further by enforcing boundaries programmatically. We can only do this once each component has achieved 100% isolation. While we are still researching the approach that we want to take, the high-level plan is to have each component only load the other components that it has explicitly depended on. This would result in runtime errors if it tried to access code in a component that it hadn't depended on. We could also trigger runtime errors or failing tests when components are accessed through things other than their publicly defined API. A nice benefit of having all of these dependencies explicitly stated is that it will allow us to build up and visualize our dependency graph, which we can then inspect and use to remove any accidental or circular dependencies. We've learned that it's important to use your software to enforce the ideas of how you want your software to be built. People with context will always be leaving and new people will always be joining, so just asking nicely will never be enough. All this work that we've put into isolating dependencies and enforcing boundaries has made it much easier for us to extract pieces out of the core code base when necessary. This might happen because it just doesn't make sense living in there or because there are different technical requirements on them. This work also enables us to swap out old components that are no longer serving our merchants for new redesigned ones more easily. We still have a lot of work that we want to do to make this complete, but the progress that we have made so far tells us that it is absolutely worthwhile work. A lot of the exciting products that we've announced at Unite this year would not have been possible without first investing in componentization. Good software architecture is a constantly evolving task, and the correct solution for your app absolutely depends on the scale that you're operating at. If your team does choose to go the microservices direction, transitioning first to a modular monolith will make this process much more painless. It also significantly lowers the stakes of getting the component boundaries right the first time. We've definitely iterated on ours a lot. A well-designed system can greatly increase the joy of developing in it and be a powerful tool for speeding up your team's productivity. I've included a couple of blog posts to read if you're interested in more information on this topic. I'll let you guys take photos. I'll go back, but that's it from me, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you.